you so all for this yours. live webinar on COVID-19 and neurological complication. For this webinar, we have a renowned neurologist, Dr. B. Arul Selvan, consultant neurologist, Royal Care Super Speciality Hospital, Coimbatore. I would like to welcome him on behalf of the department, on behalf of the institution, on, on behalf of our head of the institution, Dr. S.P. Dhanbal. So thank you so much for accepting our invitation and being here with us today, sir, in spite of your busy schedule. So with this, I request our beloved principal, Dr. S.P. Dhanbal, sir, to give his opening remarks. Uh, good morning uh, to the resource person and also the fellow participants. Uh, today we are going to have an uh, exclusive uh, webinar on the topic COVID-19 and neurological complications. It's going to be delivered by Dr. V. Arusulam, the consultant neurologist from Royal Care Super Specialty Hospitals, Kwaimatu. On behalf of our Chancellor, His, His Holiness Jagat Guru Sri Sri Deshendra Maga Swamiji of Suturmant and the Honorable Co Chancellor Dr. P. Suresh, Vice Chancellor Dr. Suresh Nursing, Dr. Majunata Register, and also the staff and students of JSS College of Pharmacy, UTI, and also on my personal behalf, we extend a warm welcome to our today's resource person, Dr. V. Arul And uh, and my compliment goes to the Department of Pharmacology, led by Dr. T.K. Pravin, and with the support of all his fellow faculty members, especially with the coordination of uh, Dr. Justin, the department has come forward to organize such a wonderful seminar uh, on this uh, COVID-19 pandemic situation. This is the current need of the topic. Uh, and definitely the participants, I understand that there are more than 750 participants, delegates, including the internal and the external uh, delegates from the other universities who have uh, showed interest and also registered. And it's a very big number. And the two during the weekend, having this such number, big number is, uh, uh, it's a very interesting and also appreciating and also it motivating us. And uh, so this day shows the confidence on the resource person of the today's, speech, uh, today's session. So with this, once again, I extend a warm welcome to our uh, resource person, Dr. V. Arun Silvan, and also all, all our uh, fellow colleagues from the Department of Pharmacology, and also from other uh, departments of JSA College of Pharmacy, OT, and also the distinguished participants uh, who are registered for this uh, program. So with this, I wish you all success for this uh, today's uh, session. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Now I request uh, Dr. Justin, the coordinator of this program, to kindly introduce the uh, speaker of the day. So, good morning. Uh, it's my immense pleasure to introduce Dr. Arun Chilvan. has completed his uh, DM Neurology from Institute of Neurology at Madras Medical College. Then he went to England to sharpen his knowledge in <coughs> neurology. He passed his MRCP examination. He com completed his training in Oxford under internationally renowned professor at Redolfi Infirmary. He was appointed as a consultant at uh, Walton Center for Neurology in Liverpool which is a premier neuroscience institute in north of England. He was a consultant there for nearly seven years. He was also nominated for fellowship by Royal College of Physicians of London, Edinburgh, for his outstanding achievements. Apart from general neurology, Dr. Arul Chelvan is interested in neuromuscular disorder, epilepsy, movement disorders, stroke, international neurology, headache, and nerve conduction and EMG studies. He is establishing a high quality neurology service in Coimbatore, Notably, epilepsy surgeries for intractable epilepsy movement disorder surgeries with deep vein stimulation for Parkinson's disease and dystonia. He was a leading member of team for epilepsy and movement disorder surgeries at Walton Center for Neurology. He is the first neurologist in going to do deep vein stimulation for uh, Hogan and well linked by like blind patients. He has done you know, <laughs> techniques like uh, intrathecal baclofen pump for chronic spasticity and the di diaphragmatic facing for cervical spinal cord injuries. Again, first time in Coimbatore, he presented numerous papers and posters in various national and international meetings. He has written articles in peer reviewed international journals like uh, Neurology and the uh, Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. He is a respected and highly regarded teacher and taught several undergraduate medical students and postgraduates from various specialties. He was also supervisor for PhD and DPhil students at the University of Liverpool, where he served as honorary lecturer, <laughs> lecturer in neurology. He is a member of Association of British Neurology and the Indian Academy of Neurology and the American Academy of Neurology and the British Society of Clinical Neurophysiology, to name few. 
He also conducted several courses, workshop and invitor lectures nationally and internationally. With this brief introduction, we welcome you, sir, and we request you to come and see session. Good morning. Namaskaram to everyone. Good morning, sir. And this is a great opportunity was given to me. I have to sincerely thank uh, Professor Danabal, Professor Praveen, and Dr. Justin to invite me again. It's always a pleasure to uh, speak being associated with uh, the ACS colleges at Wooty. This is my third or fourth time, I think. So it's been immense yes. pleasure to come back again and give us a lecture. Instead of coming to Wooty, I'm doing the Zoom lecture now today. <laughs> thank you to meet uh, Professor Danabal again. It says a uh, wonderful sir to meet you. To start off, okay. I'm just going to start on the neurological manifestations of COVID-19. Um, briefly, I'll introduce the subject uh, about uh, what is COVID and what uh, thing has to be done as a layman terms. And then I'll go into the neurological manifestation with detail about that. So my theme of the talk is to be like this. It'll be briefly introduced, very simply basic, what's about the virus and how does it spread? And then the pathophysiology, how does it invade the neural system and causes the damage to the central nervous system? and the peripheral nervous system, what are the neurological manifestations it can affect us, and then the briefly about the management and conclusion. Feel free to interrupt or ask any questions at the end of the sessions, please. The coronavirus is COVID-19. What do you need to know? It is a severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, which is called the SARS-CoV-2 causes of COVID-19. 19 is the year 2019. SARS-CoV-2 is a new virus. It was first identified as a respiratory symptoms with a pneumonia in Wuhan province in China in late December 2019. By March, it has spread to the various worlds and the WHO has conferred as a pandemic. It probably started in animals, probably bats, and it's now spreading between the people. As the virus is still new, we are learning the antigenicity and antibody protection so that the vaccine can be invented fairly soon. How does it been spread to the other countries? It's mainly the travelers. Many countries have detected almost all of them in the virus in travelers. Some people who were in contact with the travelers were infected by them. It is possible that almost every part of the world has got some corona patients or COVID-19 patients. How it has been spread? It's mainly spread by the droplets. So as we spread the influence of virus in cold, and then the, when we talk, when you cough, and when you sneeze, these droplets have been spread in the air and it's become an airborne infection. People can get infected when these droplets enter the nose, eyes, and mouth. And touching the contaminated objects will also, like these are all called fomites, the secondary objects like pencils, computer screens, laptop, telephones, mobile phones. And if you touch these, and then it can also spread. Some people have been infected without any uh, having symptoms. They're called asymptomatic carriers. What are the symptoms has been recorded so far? So far, the fever is the commonest symptom, followed by cough, sore throat, the general virological damage which causes a fatigue, shortness of breath if the respiratory system is involved. Sudden loss of smell and taste this is very unique to the COVID-19. Uh, sudden loss of smell and taste is almost, uh, seems to be pathognomical. We will discuss in detail why it is. And then headache, muscle aches, and some abdominal symptoms like diarrhea and abdominal pain. Symptom starts, after one day after the exposure, up to 14 days, they can contract the symptoms. Some people have no symptoms and they are called asymptomatic carriers. So how do you maintain it? Uh, prevent to contract the coronavirus. So we have to wash our hands very frequently with the soap and water, alcohol-based sanitizer, and cover your cough and sneeze so that you won't spread to the other people by preventing the droplets infection. Do not share the food and drinks and personal items including the mobile phones. If you have any symptoms, then you need to seek the medical advice and isolate yourself. Always keep one to two meters in distance, especially in malls, temples, marriages, and other ceremonies. Avoid touching your faces frequently, eyes, nose, and mouth, and that's where it spreads. Avoid shaking hands. The Namaskar, the Indian Namaste has been very famous, even with the British. So they stopped shaking the hands, uh, bow or nod, and uh, culturally appropriate gesture, whichever suits them to treat this. Avoid activities which exposed to large groups of my people. So in, in Tamil Nadu, it's been a, a, a lockdown, and they've been announcing that uh, the malls and cinema theaters will not be open. 
work from home as much as possible and avoid non essential travel avoid exposure clean and disinfect the areas as soon as possible and then every day keep up away from the people who are sick don't let them cough or sneeze on you avoid visiting the hospitals the high prone areas especially the intensive care unit near and here the the icu areas so during this period covid infection if you contracted the infection it can be extremely stressful so keep yourself in the best possible health sleep well eat well healthy vegetables fruits and physically be active doing a lot of exercise take breaks frequently focus not to too much get the information about the corona virus so it will be disappointing and uh, discouraging there can be a lot of uh, pessimistic messages which will be going through the, in the media so don't listen majority of them recover very well 90% of them recover very well except the minority patients to get infected and succumb to the infection so this with the basic introduction i'll go on to the minimal subjects so the novel corona virus has originated from the yuhan city province in china it started the first cases in december 2019 who the world health organization has confirmed as a pandemic in march 2020 till to date uh, roughly around 5 million cases has been infected with the corona virus and then is more than 300000 deaths has been reported it is caused by a severe acute respiratory syndrome corona virus otherwise called sars covid 2 the so most common and important presentation is with the respiratory disease but not with the neurological problem six corona viruses have been identified to infect the humans four of them causes a seasonal flu like symptoms like simple headache body ache malaise uh, rhinorrhea and then it stops accounting for 15 to 30% of the upper respiratory tract infection only two viruses which causes a severe pandemic that is sars cov 2003 It, uh, again it originated from the asian countries especially from the china the middle east respiratory syndrome which is in 2002 uh, that's an another uh, uh, pandemic which happened in 2002 now how does it invade the central nervous system the corona virus as the primary target is only the respiratory epithelium it goes as only into the lungs it is not a neurotropic virus at all the target receptor is a angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor after entry into the cell it multiplies in rna is released in the cytoplasm and then it is translated and replicated in the cytoplasm after the formation of the envelope protein the incorporation of the rna into the virus it is released into the circulation the angiotensin converting enzyme receptors are found in the neural glial cells and also in the spinal neurons that's why there were lot of neurological manifestation the mice experiment confirms that the corona virus enters the brain through the olfactory epithelium that may be the main reason why the patient has got uh, anosmia and agusia anosmia is a loss of smell agusia is a loss of taste this may be the reason the virus enters through the olfactory epithelium on the way of entry it causes damage to the olfactory nerves and causes the anosmia viremia when the virus enters into the blood circulation it also causes a damage to the blood brain barrier and then the virus can directly enter into the central nervous system from the blood occasionally virus can also enter into the peripheral nervous system by breaking down the nerve terminals and entering into that the central nervous system damage can be postulated by two problems one is a hypoxic brain damage when there is pneumonia and the respiratory problem and they get a hypoxia and then the hypoxia can cause a brain damage and second thing the virus can cause the immune mediated damage how does it do we do that we will see that it's a severe pneumonia can result in systemic hypoxia causing a very severe brain damage and then increased accumulation of the carbon dioxide which is called hypercarbia can cause a local vasodilatation again it causes more damage anaerobic metabolism with accumulation of the toxic compounds one the immune cascade has been uh, released and the immune cascade has been started and then it produces a various chemicals like leukotrienes and then these leukotrienes is potentially toxic to uh, various endothelium including the central nervous system and the respiratory system this results in neuronal swelling and brain edema so it is called cytokine storm interleukin 6 you see level we measure when the patient has got a cytokine storm in the rapidly deteriorating and then the hypoxia settles in and the interleukin 6 level increases 
and then we have to use special drug like monoclonal antibody tocilizumab to sustain or suppress the cytokine storm so how does it produce the cytokine storm there is a release of interleukin 6 which causes a vascular leakage and activation of the complement and coagulation cascade has been activated that's why they get a lot of thrombosis pulmonary embolism cerebral venous thrombosis stroke and uh, peripheral deep vein thrombosis also in some patients the coagulation cascade has been initiated and caused disseminated intravascular coagulation thrombosis everywhere and the patients die which ultimately causes the end organ damage this all comp- started by this virus which initiates the lymphocyte activation macrophages and endothelial cells so what are all the cns manifestation the central nervous system manifestation can be very simple like headache and dizziness and vertigo and then the serious disorders can also happen the most often the cerebrovascular disease this is the only virus which causes a stroke in young adults so we need to be aware of these complications so when the young patient comes with a stroke suspect a corona outbreak or covid 19 impaired consciousness acute hemorrhagic necrotizing encephalopathy simple encephalopathy transverse myelitis and then encephalitis epilepsy ataxia anosmia and then it can also causes a peripheral nervous system damage we already discussed the peripheral nerves can be uh, invaded by the uh, toxic nerve terminals and then causes a peripheral nerve damage like the gulen barre syndrome simple neuralgia neuralgic type of pain can also invade the muscles and the muscle can get uh, damage and it can cause polymyositis a simple myalgia skeletal muscle injury rhabdomyolysis so we'll discuss each condition one by one encephalitis we all know encephalitis is a inflammation of the brain parenchyma and then mostly followed by the respiratory symptoms initially the respiratory symptoms occurs and then the encephalitis starts in neurological manifestation were typical like other viral encephalitis the patient presents with irritability confusion reduced level of consciousness and seizures and some of the patients do have been reported with neck stiffness indicating there is a meningitis component also hiccups ataxia is a poor balance oscillopsy as a decreased vision or jumping vision and the patient also had a bilateral facial weakness when we did the lumbar puncture the lumbar puncture showed a increased protein and then elevated cells particularly the lymphocyte seems to be high so that is called lymphocytic pleocytosis in some cases not all of them the csa polymerase chain reaction shows um, sars cov2 was positive the mri brain showed a high signal intensities especially in the temporal lobe eeg showed a, again involvement of the temporal lobe with focal slowing in some patients they were throwing seizures continuously that condition called uh, status epilepticus or non convulsive status epilepticus in one patient has been reported high dose of corticosteroids at the initial period seems to be suppress the immune breakdown so that it uh, prevents the damage and host inflammatory responses the initial signs like any other viral infection they do present with a non specific headache malaise tiredness weakness nausea and vomiting and abdominal pain and then later on if they deteriorate the level of consciousness they go into the deep coma and uh, they can have altered mental state it also they become confused delirious disoriented hallucinations especially visual hallucinations they think that uh, somebody is standing there when nobody is there agitations restlessness irritability personality changes suddenly they become very angry against their very close relatives behavioral disorders the circadian rhythm has been seems to be disturbed so they will be sleeping more on the day time and less on the night time occasionally a frank psychosis has also been reported as a part of manifestation of encephalitis or encephalopathy in covid-19 patients seizures are another important manifestation more than 50% of the patients do have seizures when they have a cns involvement severe neurological deficits like hemiplegia or monoplegia has also been reported every possible neurological focal deficit has also been reported the patient can it all depends upon the site of the involvement of the brain if they have a left hemisphere is involved they present with the speech disturbances and the posterior fossa like cerebellum is involved then they do have a ataxia 
uh, and the hemiparesis with the breast deep and then jerks involuntary movements when the basal ganglia has been involved in cranial epilepsies when there is a base of skull base is involved with extraocular nerve palsy is third nerve fourth nerve sixth nerve and seventh nerve is the commonest one it has been affected in covid-19 and this is a typical mri of the one of the patient which shows the uh, you can see that uh, the, the there is a temporal lobe involvement this is a temporal lobe and you can see high intense signal changes in the right the temporal lobe this is a lateral part of the temporal lobe and this is a medial part of the temporal lobe called the hippocampus they are very specifically affecting that part this is a asymmetrical involvement of the right temporal lobe and the left temporal lobe and this is not from covid-19 this is only from the herpes encephalitis clinical consideration what will be the csf lumbar puncture will show will show the normal glucose and like in bacterial meningitis where the csf sugar is very less the protein will be marginally elevated there is a lymphocytic predominant confirming it is a viral infection and sometimes the csf polymerase chain reaction for covid-19 seems to be positive in encephalopathies it's not a direct invasion it's a reflex mechanisms causing the brain to swell up brain edema causes and in the pathophysiological process in the brain that usually develops an infection following few days and it does causes a changes in personality confusion and irritability the largest study is come from the wuhan province they followed up up to 214 patients who had cns symptoms and dizziness and headache and impaired consciousness seems to be the highest presentation acute disseminated encephalomyelitis otherwise known as adem it's a syndrome of multifocal demyelination either associated with the infection along with the infectious process or once the infection settles one or two weeks later they present with the focal neurological symptoms two patients have been reported they do have a normal csf because it's a, a, some kind of signature mark which has been left with the covid-19 and then uh, and then the damage happens a little bit later the only abnormalities which we picked up is the mri mri showed some high signal changes and then they improved with the treatment of high dose of steroids methylprednisolone 1 g for 3 days and then intravenous immunoglobulin acute hemorrhagic encephalopathy is an another manifestation of the encephalitis of covid-19 initially reported from usa a 56 year old female three day history of fever and cough and altered mental state and mri showed a hemorrhagic rim enhancing lesion in the bilateral thalamus medial temporal lobe and subinsular regions and the patient received the intravenous immunoglobulin and they do showed some improvement but not a complete improvement the hemorrhagic encephalopathy has also been reported in very rarely with influenza virus but uh, it seems to be a bit more with the covid-19 transverse myelitis is another uh, reported case so what is transverse myelitis is an inflammatory lesion occurring in the spinal cord either completely or incompletely and then characterized by subacute or acute motor weakness of the legs and arms with autonomic dysfunction which means involvement of the bladder and bowel myelitis means inflammation of the spinal cord transverse means simply it occurs at the horizontal level so that's why it's called transverse across the width of the spinal cord it causes a demyelination of the focal area of the spinal cord at the horizontal level it can be caused by the infections non infectious agents and uh, sometimes idiopathic causes also but we are focusing only on the uh, covid-19 but there are other viruses which can cause the transverse myelitis like enterovirus herpes virus epstein barr virus rabies also and aids virus the htlv1 human lymphocytic uh, t cell lymphotropic virus which causes a tropical spastic paraplegia some of the bacterial infection can also cause transverse myelitis but we will restrict only to covid-19 a post vaccinal myelitis has also been reported especially after the rabies vaccine or influenza vaccine and then rare inflammatory disorders like multiple sclerosis neuromyelitis optica which are all associated with anti nmo antibody or anti mog antibody syndromes has also got the transverse myelitis so what's the immunopathogenesis the virus causes the initiation of the lymphocytic activation and then the involvement of the both gray and white matter it is not a purely demyelinating disorder there is an inflammatory disorder which causes the destruction of the neurons and axons and oligodendrocytes 
and also the myelin the autopsy reports have described that lymphocytic infiltration is the main cause of the event which has been caused by the viral uh, symptoms of transverse myelitis usually develop between hours to days sometimes it can rapidly progress within the period of 24 hours there are three more major symptoms one you can have a motor symptoms they have a weakness and paralysis of the arms and legs they can also have the sensory symptoms like paresthesia spins and needles numbness or a clear cut level of sensory loss from the uh, waist downwards an autonomic manifestation like loss of sweating bladder and bowel involvement these are all the important clinical manifestations of any transverse myelitis when the cervical cord involved then you get a quadriplegia when the thoracic cord involved you get a paraplegia when there is a combination of upper motor and lower motor lesion then you suspect a conus medullaris sensory symptoms usually as discussed in loss of sensation below the level of inflammation paresthesia numbness lehermit sign is when they bend the neck and then they get uh, shooting like uh, electric shock like sensations and that's a lehermit sign as we discussed earlier if the lesion is in the cervical level when they get a quadriplegia when they get a thoracic level they get a paraplegia when they get a lesion with the conus medullaris they get the combination of upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs and the bladder and bowel involvement complete means more than three vertebrae that is longitudinally more than three vertical segments symmetric involvement on both sides incomplete means incomplete involvement only half of the spinal cord is involved like brown shepherd syndrome this is a, a patient with the covid 19 uh, mri showed a high signal changes in this uh, you can see that appreciate about one to two bright white signals in the thoracic spinal cord there is another lesion in the cervical spinal cord this is a different patient you can see a linear hyperintense signals long segment myelitis has been reported 1 2 3 4 5 segments has been reported so how do we confirm the diagnosis again the csf study will show marginally elevated protein sugar will be normal and then the uh, lymphocytic predominant pleocytosis will be there and the mri will further confirm in some cases csf uh, shows a covid 19 has been positive sometimes the uh, mri can be negative and then you need to be a little bit more careful in dealing with those patients again some more patients is showing a long segment myelitis these are all from not from covid 19 but this is a patient who had a anti nmo antibody syndrome positive she had a long segment myelitis you can see that the involvement of one from here 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 very long segment myelitis so what's the treatment in addition to the ramdesivir steroids seems to be very helpful and then corticosteroids typically methylprednisolone 1 g intravenously for 3 to 5 days and the plasma exchange is a form of hemodialysis We're using a different membrane filter you filter out the antibody and then reinfuse the plasma so acute myelitis again has been reported from wuhan a 66 year old male presented with a fever and body and headache developed a flaccid paralysis of bilateral lower limbs a sensory level at the level of t10 and urinary and bowel incontinence the polymerase chain reaction seems to be positive for the covid-19 in this patient and this patient was treated with intravenous immunoglobulin which is expensive and then steroids and combination of antivirals and then he was better and discharged so the main pathophysiology of this uh, either uh, the transverse myelitis or the respiratory involvement it seems to be a cytokine storm increased level of uh, interleukin 6 and then other inflammatory markers like in serum ferritin c reactive protein and interleukin 6 seems to be helpful in managing these patients so as i told you earlier the cerebrovascular seems to be a unique presentation in in viral infection with the covid 19 the cv has been reported in 6 to 10% of the patients in covid positive 5% had an ischemic stroke 1% had intracerebral hemorrhage and 1% had a cerebral venous thrombosis and cases have been reported in most all literatures in all over the world that including in india italy wuhan usa netherlands uh, and it specifically affects more than age of 60 years many had comorbidities like diabetes hypertension and hyperlipidemia 
it seems to be median days of about 10 days after the respiratory illness once the respiratory illness started and then the endothelium has been damaged and the cytokine storm has been set on and then after that the patient developed into the procoagulative state and developed as subsequently the stroke and some of the patients have been associated with aortic thrombosis and limb ischemia again indicating a thrombosis in the aorta and also in the peripheral vessels deep vein thrombosis has also been reported and we talked about the pulmonary embolism the d dimer the blood d dimer concentration seems to be very high serum ferritin is high the esr crp the other inflammatory markers all seems to be high indicating that the patient is entering into the procoagulopathic state patient needs anticoagulation like low molecular weight heparin or fluxin or heparin they are all positive some patients showed a positive lupus anticoagulant anti cardiolipin antibody and anti beta 2 glycoprotein and one antibodies have been reported in covid 19 associated stroke as i discussed earlier the low molecular weight heparin is in recommended and indicated how does it act it does act on the damage of the endothelial cells an active inflammatory and then the coagulation cascade has been initiated and indicate suggesting a thrombotic pathway has been damaged endothelial dysfunction can potentially indicates a micro and macrovascular complication for all of these patients we discussed earlier the anosmia and agusia anosmia is a loss of smell agusia is a loss of taste and then first has been reported from the usa and initially from the yuhan province also it seems to be unique for covid-19 again why it happens because of the damage to the olfactory epithelium and then the olfactory epithelium is the one is responsible for conducting the smell it's an endorgan damage and then the smell cannot be transmitted to the olfactory bulb and the entorhinal cortex in the brain so smell function and taste function is commonly reported as loss of sensations and it's very unique for the covid-19 as a peripheral nerve damage and we come to the gulen barre syndrome gulen barre syndrome is an acute uh, polyradiculopathy characterized by rapidly progressive symmetrical limb weakness and then reflexes have been lost with minimal sensory symptoms but no sensory signs some patients do have ascending paralysis it is called landry gulen barre syndromes and they have bilateral facial weakness also so how do we confirm the diagnosis doing the lumbar puncture we showed elevated cis protein and there won't be any cells so it has been described as albuminocytological dissociation and the nerve conduction show, study showed a typical demyelinating polyneuropathy covid-19 has been reported with the gbs the gulen barre syndrome from china iran italy and states also zavo reported the first case a lady of 61 year old female present with acute onset of leg weakness in bilateral symmetrical weakness severe fatigue and progression of weakness happens in one day this is a typical presentation of a gulen barre syndrome started out with a backache leg pain paresthesias minimal sensory symptoms and then the motor weakness which is slowly ascending over a period of 1 to 2 days and the nerve conduction study will show a typical demyelinating polyneuropathy with the dispersion of compound muscle action potential slowing of the conduction velocity both sensory and motor but sensory will not be affected as much as we expect and the uh, upper limb and the lower limb will also show the features of demyelinating peripheral neuropathy these patients treated with intravenous immunoglobulin with a good recovery sadak from iran he reported again some more patients 61 year old male the patient was on diabetic cough and fever dyspnea two weeks before indicating a viral infection and covid-19 is positive and this patient also had ascending paralysis and bilateral facial weakness nerve conduction again again so this suggested combination of demyelinating and motor axonal neuropathy he was managed with intravenous immunoglobulin and he improved well so to date uh, it has been about 19 patients have been reported with the gulen barre syndrome all of them are covid positive two of them died because of a severe respiratory paralysis they need to be intubated and uh, kept in intensive care unit for several days but they could not wean him up and died of respiratory failure 12 improved and 5 had a minor residual weakness and they are also showing a continuous improvement so overall 17 patients showed a very positive outcome except a couple of them which they could not save the pathophysiology remains the same for idiopathic gulen barre syndrome or post viral polyneuropathy which is i think unusual about the covid related 
Cullen Barry syndrome. They also respond very well to the treatment, and the responsiveness to the intravenous immunoglobulin seems to be well. We we'll just do one case study: a 40-year-old male, uh, sorry, woman, presented with the on 17th March. He presented with the she presented with the dyspnea and diarrhea, and severe myalgias. One week previously, coming to the hospital, he had a paresthesia, which is creepy crawlies in the legs more than arms. and weakness of the leg started on 25th of april and then it started progressing and then it involved the upper limbs so she could not do the handwriting and the handwriting becomes a hand scratch initially lumbar puncture was done which was normal nerve conduction study showed absent h reflexes and f responses in gulen barre syndrome the earliest manifestation could be in the nerve conduction study which can pick it up the abnormalities of the f responses and h reflexes she is also a diabetic for the 10 years and she has hypothyroidism there was no sphincter disturbances she complained severe low back pain and mild postural like headiness she did not have any great respiratory symptoms except a cough and and uh, uh, no shortness of breath or palpitation blood pressure was normal indicating there is no autonomic neuropathy and mild weakness of the neck flexors upper limbs were 4 by 5 And the lower limbs were three by five. Sensory examination was normal on her, but the deep tendon reflexes were absent in the triceps and ankle, whereas in the biceps and supinator and the knee jerk were obtainable, but only on reinforcement. Plantar sweat flexors. The MRI did not show any compressive elements, and uh, she was treated with intravenous immunoglobulin, 0.4 gram per kilogram body weight, which is a standard dose for recommended for Guillain-Barré syndrome. and then she improved remarkably well repeated nerve conduction study showed an improvement and then some minor abnormalities in the f waves with the crown dispersion at the time of discharge she was uh, ambulating fairly well with the zimmer frame with the walker frame and then she is showing continuous improvement in the follow up but there were some persistent paresthesias in the legs for which she was getting gabapentin so the typical gulen barre syndrome is usually the case and then they present with like paresthesias usually starts with the disease and then the gulen barre syndrome is a symmetrical motor weakness in the arms and legs with involvement of the respiratory and facial weakness and loss of deep tendon jerk is a unique phenomena and then they do have sensory symptoms but the sensory signs like loss of vibration loss of uh, touch perception will be absent the lumbar puncture will show a characteristic albuminocytological dissociation which means that there will be elevated protein but there won't be any cells whereas in transverse myelitis and bacterial meningitis there will be elevation of the cells elevation of the protein sugar will be less but uh, in gulen barre syndrome there will be elevation of protein alone without any disturbances in the sugar and there won't be any cells that's what called albuminocytological dissociation recovery does happen but it take weeks to few months and this is uh, landry a french neurologist who invented the gulen barre syndrome or who described the gulen barre syndrome so that the neurological illness has been named after them and this is in 1916 they documented their observation in the french neurological journal and this is a typical pathophysiology of the, you can see that there is a myelin sheath looks like an insulation uh, in the wires as we see the commonly the insulation in the wire and that insulation or myelin sheath has been lost by damage by the virus mediated inflammatory responses and this is notes of ranvier this is myelin myelin when the myelin has been lost you cannot conduct the nerve impulses and the patient develop a weakness and that is called conduction failure or conduction block And the myelin sheath has been remyelination, and that's why the recovery does happens. Coming to the end of the lecture, so myalgia and myositis. Mao reported the muscle involvement in seventeen patients and six patients in a severe non-severely ill group, and seventeen in the severely ill group. It indicates that the direct muscle damage because of the virus and the creatine kinase should be more than two hundred in some of the patients. Probably the direct effect on the virus. into the muscle and causing the muscle damage it could be an infection mediated immune responses which can also cause a muscle damage um, but unfortunately we could not do any emg or muscle biopsy in these patients to conclude my talk covid-19 primarily affects the respiratory system 
but the neurological manifestations are uncommon but it's becoming increasingly recognized that about 10% of the patients need to be aware unless otherwise you will lose a patient and it has to be detected early and managed early with very well knowledge neurological illness may proceed in some respiratory system involvement in some patients hypercoagulable states prothrombotic state and cerebrovascular disease like strokes or seems to be an important neurological manifestations in covid-19 which is not been reported in many other viral infection which is very very important it's rarely seen in other viral conditions so what will be the future directions overall the proportion of patients with neurological manifestation is seems to be small in compared with the respiratory system manifestation because many of the patients do present with the fever cough cold and only in 10% of the patients they do present with the neurological manifestations like headache dizziness vomiting encephalopathy and then encephalitis facial weakness neurological illness and neurological paralysis expectation is that that the 50% of 50 to 80% of the world population might be infected before the herd immunity develops healthcare planners and policy makers needed to be aware of this growing burden because it causes a economic disasters sequences sequela complications financial strain stress loss of business and whatever you name it all the industries have been affected healthcare industries transport industries and it's caused a enormous damage to the growth of the country especially the third world countries like uh, some of the countries have been struggling to meet with this pandemic so careful clinical and diagnostic and epidemiological studies are needed to help define the neurological manifestations thank you very much i'm happy to take questions please if there are any justin sir thank you sir uh, thank you for your wonderful session sir very informative session a uh, couple of the questions are there uh, i request our senior professor dr anand vijay kumar to uh, take over this session uh, thank you mr justin so thank you sir for your wonderful presentation so there are few question asked by the participants sir yes sir okay so one question is is it possible to use sars covid as a vector in any any neuro concerns like like a better targeted drug delivery system to the brain or as a tool to deliver mutated gene etc or more importantly as a developmental tool in small drugs or nootropics yes sir that's a wonderful question i think the question uh, the participant has asked a question because there was an inventory that duchenne muscular dystrophy you all heard about that duchenne muscular dystrophy is a catastrophic primary muscle disorder which causes damage to the young children so dmd gene has been delivered Uh, through a vector virus vector i think that's what the participant is thinking that whether the virus can be used as a vector or not see this virus is a new virus to us we don't know the full uh, detailed study of the virus although they have a spike proteins we not invented the vaccines and anything it's too early to conclude that this virus has been used or cannot be used as a target uh, for the gene therapy so we need to wait, wait uh, from the all over the world before it can be uh, used as a vector but my personally think is that i don't think we can use as a vector virus vector for the gene therapy in this scenario now because uh, we are not fully understood about the virus and we are not yet detected the vaccines and without any vaccine to inject a virus into a patient and the patient can be potentially a covid positive and they can spread the virus to the others so it's not uh, in this state at present now by bernalli i noticed a point in your slide say corticosteroids can be used in encephalitis caused by sars cov2 but since suppression is immunity or side effect of corticosteroids i wonder if that would be a contraindication by putting the patient at higher risk towards infection yeah that's a good question we always th- think that the steroids when you give the immune suppression is happens and then there will be a potential complications of another re- uh, reinfections or uh, 
super added bacterial infection but that's not the case at all the viral infection causes the immune storm immune mediated immune responses so we are suppressing only the immune responses by giving steroid these steroids are given only for the short term period it's been recommended by the american academy of neurology endorsed by other neurological societies all over the world so by giving the steroids either high dose of intravenous methylprednisolone or dexamethasone we suppress short term immune response by which is caused by the virus so it will be beneficial to the patient and many patients have been recovered very well by giving the steroids so we don't we don't need to worry about the other things so one more question yes sir to use ac inhibitors in patients with covid and hypertension Uh, covid uh, the ac inhibitors have been tried because i told that the ac inhibitors is the one which is a, a target virus has been bound and causes subsequent damage in although it is not evidence based but some patients we do try with the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 inhibitors so it can be tried that way to control okay. okay thank you the last question is what are the chances of covid-19 patient getting neurological manifestation post discharge uh, that's a very good question again we discussed a condition called acute disseminated encephalomyelitis after this develops after one or two weeks after the virus infection or any virus influenza virus so they do get a neurological manifestation one or two weeks so these patients like adem and tantus myelitis has been reported when they discharge and they did get a neurological symptoms so it can perfectly happen so that's why the patients are clearly followed up after the covid-19 infection for uh, 14 days to see whether there are any worsening respiratory symptoms because the patient do develop uh, interstitial lung disease also so to make sure that they do not drop the oxygen saturation level at the time we also look for the neurological manifestations so your delayed neurological manifestations like uh, and uh, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or a uh, transverse myelitis can happen with the covid-19 patients two or three weeks after the discharge so they should be closely followed up assessment has been completed and i thank you very much sir for your presentation and also the answering the participant questions that has been asked made based on your presentation so i thank our principal dr s p darbar for providing this opportunity and inviting dr arul selvam for this presentation and also i thank our department head dr pravin for making this and wonderful session and i also thank uh, dr justin for making this arrangements and also the it department of our team dr jack ma for making this happen and without any difficulties thank you sir thank you very much sir thanks for the opportunity given to me many thanks for the faculty members especially justin and danabal sir thank you sir thank, thank you, you sir.